Will she be dark or fair? Blonde as a new mop and beautiful as the girl on the feed store calendar. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at ClassicMovieRev.com. Today on the Classic Movie Rev podcast, we are taking on Western Noir Roughshod 1949. Before we get going, I want to remind you to follow the links in the show notes or from the site to visit our store where we have some unique designs that you can get on t-shirts, buttons, stickers, mask, anything you want. So check that out. Today's movie, Roughshod 1949, is definitely a western and maybe a film noir. This film strays from the traditional western formula by making the female characters more prominent than usual. Many people, including myself, consider this a film noir as well as a western. The topic is hotly debated. Roger Fristo of TCM.com wrote in an article titled Western Noir February 19 that Roughshod 1949 was also screened among the Western Noir films. This film is not beloved. On IMDb.com, the film has a low 6.7 rating. On RottenTomatoes.com, the film is brutalized with no tomato meter score and only 50% audience approval. New York Times film critic Bosley Carruthers said in a June 17, 1949 review, quote, represents an effort to get a wee bit away from the usual literal formula of the low-budget Western film, telling a romantic story of a cowboy who has to herd ten horses, four dames, and his kid brother over a mountain pass, while all the time menaced by the nearness of three desperate renegades. It has, at least, the virtue of a mildly intriguing plot rendered occasionally amusing by the yammering of the dames, and it has a familiar advantage of some excellent outdoor camera work, which makes the journey agreeable, if only for the scenery. But like most low-budget westerns, it bears the heavy stamp of muddled and mild direction and weak performances in some wheeled horse rolls. There's nothing wrong with Robert Sterling as the hero, except that he is damned with one of those pretty boy faces that look store-bought in western films. But Gloria Graham is rather silly as one of the four dames he buys, and Claude Jarman is plum sissy as a supposedly ranged hardened kid. Myrna Dell and Jeff Donnell flop around as two other of the dames, and John Ireland scowls with all the darkness and determination of a professional rogue. One rather gets the impression that RKO wanted to make a low-budget stagecoach in Roughshod, but it didn't pull enough on the whiffle trees. Unquote. Wow couple of things here. I don't think you can call people dames or a sissy anymore. Secondly, this movie features Gloria Graham running around in the West. This movie is worth watching just to see one of film noir's femme fatales running around on the screen. We have a ton of returning actors, so we better get going. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Gloria Graham played saloon girl Mary Wells. Graham was first covered in It's a Wonderful Life, 1946. Jeff Donnell played saloon girl Elaine and Wyatt. I have to say she was a whiny pain in the butt, and this wasn't her finest performance. Donnell was first covered in The Blue Gardenia, 1953. Martha Heyer played saloon girl Marsha, the only one without a last name. Heyer was first covered in First Men in the Moon, 1964. Sarah Hayden was convincing as Ma Wyatt, Hayden was first covered in The Bishop's Wife, 1947. John Ireland played Lednoff, an escaped convict set on murdering Clay Phillips. Ireland was first covered in the western Red River, 1948. Paul E. Burns was uncredited as a merchant named Mr. Hayes. Burns was first covered in Night Editor, 1946. Sean McClory played the unfortunate gold miner named Fowler. McClory was first covered in the great sci-fi Them, 1954. Robert Sterling played driven cowboy Clay Phillips. Sterling was born in Pennsylvania in 1917. He graduated from the University of Pittsburgh before going into clothing sales. Sometime later, he decided to try acting. Columbia signed Sterling in 1939. While there, he was in shorts and two-reelers. Sterling was signed at MGM in 1941 because Robert Taylor was joining the Navy. Sterling was prepped with movies like Ringside Maisie 1941, Two-Faced Woman, 1941, 
Johnny Eager, 1941, I'll Wait For You, 1941, The Getaway, 1941, This Time For Keeps, 1942, and Somewhere I'll Find You, 1942. Sterling joined the Army Air Corps and served as a pilot instructor during World War II. When he returned, his movie career never hit the expected height. During this time, he was in movies such as Rough Shot, 1949, Bunko Squad, 1950, Showboat, 1951, and Column South, 1953. Sterling and his second wife, Ann Jeffries, started working as a singing club act. They did well, and as a result, they were cast in television's Topper, 1953-55. More movies such as The Return to Peyton Place, 1961, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, 1961, and A Global Affair, 1964, followed. He worked on television until 1986. Sterling also worked for a successful computer software company and formed a family business manufacturing golf clubs. He died in 2006. Claude Jarman Jr. played Clay's younger brother, Steve. Jarman was born in Tennessee in 1934. When he was 12, Jarman won a talent search and was cast in The Yearling, 1946. His performance was well received and he was awarded a miniature honorary Oscar. Jarman was set to be an MGM studio star, but he never found the magic. He had a few movies that include High Barbary, 1947, The Sun Comes Up, 1949, Rough Shod, 1949, Intruder in the Dust, 1949, and Rio Grande, 1950. In the early 50s, he was loaned out for small parts and wasn't able to break into television work. Jarman returned to Nashville, where he finished high school and graduated from Vanderbilt University. After spending three years in the Navy, Jarman returned to Hollywood, but couldn't find movie work. He worked in various jobs, and after a 19-year hiatus, he appeared in Centennial in 1979. Myrna Dell played another saloon girl named Helen Carter. Dell was born in California in 1924. She started as a showgirl, and one of her earlier roles in film was in Sigfield Girl, 1941. She returned to club work until she returned to Hollywood in 1943. She was in a lot of odors and other films such as 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, 1944, Nocturne, 1946, The Lost Tribe, 1949, The Girl from Jones Beach, 1949, The Furies, 1950, The Bushwhackers, 1952, and Ma Barker's Killer Brood, 1960. She was a regular on television until 1981 and had a recurring role on China Smith, 1952-53. Dell worked as a columnist and is credited with inventing autograph shows. She died in 2011. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Three escaped convicts wearing striped uniforms come over a hill and find three cowboys by a fire. The convict's leader, Lednoff, John Ireland, guns the three cowboys down without mercy. The convicts steal the clothes and horses from the murdered men. They ride away as the credits roll. Jed Graham, Jeff Corey, is traveling down the road when he discovers the sight of the three murdered cowboys. Graham finds the convict's uniforms in the fire. He heads on to town and meets a wagon coming in the other direction. He knows the four occupants of the wagon as they are ladies of the evening from the town of Aspen. The leader of the ladies is Mary Wells, Gloria Graham, along with Elaine Wyatt, Jeff Donnell, Marsha, Martha Hires, and Helen Carter, Myrna Dell. Graham helps them drive their wagon down the hill. Elaine is a real Debbie Downer. Did you sell your place? Well, not exactly. They decided that gambling and dancing were bad for people. Can I make it? Depends on how good you drive. Well, she's a little out of practice. Slide over. I'm sliding all the way over. So am I. Come on, Elaine. What's the difference if we fall in the canyon? Don't talk like that. There's nothing to it once in a how. Trouble is, never was a woman who ought to handle a team. Shouldn't let them loose on the road. Uh, no disrespect meant, Miss Wells. They see the bodies in Graham's wagon, and he warns them to go back. The women say they were invited to leave town and can't go back. Back in town, Clay Phillips, Robert Sterling, and his younger brother Steve... Claude Jarman Jr. are having their wagon repaired. Graham arrives and takes the bodies to the sheriff. Sheriff Garner, Ed Cassidy, calls Clay into his office. Graham tells about the murders. The sheriff shows Clay a telegram telling that Ledenoff, Purdy, which may be Peters, who was played by Steve Savage, and McCall, 
Robert B. Williams, escaped from prison and are heading in their direction. Lednoff and Clay have issues, but the problem is not explained. The sheriff and some men head out looking for the criminals. Clay says he will continue to head towards his ranch. Now are you interested? You should be. Maybe Lednoff has heard about that Sonora ranch of yours. Maybe he has. We're going to look for him. Want to come along? I got ten horses to get over the pass before the snow covers the feed. That's more important than looking for Lednov? Like you said. If he knows where my ranch is, he'll be waiting on the front porch. Clay goes to the store and buys six boxes of 30-30 shells. Clay tells Steve that Lednov killed a man that wasn't looking. Clay buys Steve a larger rifle. Clay expects to meet Lednov on the road to his ranch. Steve is driving the wagon, and Clay is wrangling ten horses towards their ranch. They begin finding women's clothes and a trunk scattered along the road. They find the ladies' wagon broken down in the ditch at the bottom of a steep hill. Clay returns some pictures to Elaine, and she acts kind of weird. Clay knows who the ladies are, and he's not too friendly to them. This must have been in the family a long time. It was a gift from the citizens of Aspen. I'm Mary Wells. And this is Helen Carter. How do you do? I'm Clay Phillips. This is my brother, Steve. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. We found your trunk. Were you doing the driving? I was at first. Then I was hanging on. Clay loads the women and their gear into the wagon, and he says he will take them as far as the first ranch. Elaine is freaking out that they are heading towards the Wyatt Ranch, which just happens to be her last name. The group of travelers stop by a stream for the night. Mary and the others are trying to carry their weight by working. When it's dark, Clay hears the horses whinnying and goes out with his rifle. He surprises a man that turns out to be Jeff Clayton, George Cooper. Clayton is looking for Marcia so he can marry her. Mary says it won't work and Clay says he wouldn't do it, but it's okay if Clayton wants to marry her. Clayton and Marcia leave the group. Mary starts teaching Steve to read. Steve says that Clay always made him go to the other side of the street when they passed Mary's workplace. He can tell you what roots to eat when you clear out of food. He knows the difference between a possum and a coon just by looking at the tracks. More than most trappers know. He can tell you whether she'll rain or shine tomorrow just by smelling the air tonight. Now there's a lot of things he doesn't know. I hope you'll never learn. Elaine runs away into the brush. Clay and Steve begin searching for her. Steve finds her and convinces her to come back to camp. Suddenly, they see three men riding along the road. Steve takes a shot at them with his new rifle. When Clay rides back, he finds the sheriff's posse bringing Steve and Elaine back. Steve had fired on the posse. Clay takes the larger gun away from Steve. Steve spends time in the wagon with Mary learning to read. Clay gets mad and sends him back to take care of the horses. Clay says that Lednoff killed his friend. Clay tracked him down and shot him in the shoulder before bringing him back for punishment. Later, in a driving rain, Elaine, who is very sick, tries to escape from the wagon. Lednoff and his gang show up at the Wyatt Ranch. They are pretty mean to Pa, Ed Wyatt, played by James Bell, and his wife, Ma Wyatt, Sarah Hayden. My name is Wyatt. You're mighty welcome. Those are all the horses you got? Why, yes, two work horses, all I need. Mine's gone lame. Take a look at it. Don't just stand there. Take a look at it. She dropped a shoe. You shouldn't be riding it. Put another one on. Well, that won't help the stone bruise any. You ain't been around horses much, looks like. Do what you're told. They take Paul's gun and all his shells. Lednoff orders his men to leave after they eat supper. Lednoff and crew leave the ranch just before Clay and company arrive. Clay finds out that the murderers have been at the ranch. He tells the Wyatts that he's going to leave the women with them. Ma Wyatt doesn't care what kind of people they are. When Elaine is brought in, the Wyatts see that it's their runaway daughter. Ma is overjoyed. Pa then orders the other women out of his house. Clay convinces Pa to let the women stay. Mary goes out to convince Clay to take her and Helen along. Clay doesn't bite. Mary tries again in the morning. She's in your dream. Ever since you've looked after Steve, you've had the dream. Ranch on the river, good grass, good water, barn, corral, house. That part you've shared with Steve. The girl in Gingham you plan to sneak in when he isn't looking. Go on. Tell me more about her. She wears this Gingham dress, cooks popovers, makes jam in season, and makes her own soap out of pig fat and wood ashes. 
And his cheeks the color of red apples. I'll make the soap myself. But the rest is right. Will she be dark or fair? Blonde as a new mop and beautiful as the girl on the feed store calendar. Ma is tending to Elaine. Helen takes over the feeding of Elaine. Elaine says Helen and Mary need to leave with Clay and Steve. Elaine says she is not leaving the ranch. After getting Elaine all riled up, she asks Clay to take the other two away. To protect Elaine, Clay takes Mary and Helen with him on the trail. Clay leads the group over the Sonora Pass. He rides ahead and sees the three convicts, but he can't get off a shot. He stops his group. Clay scouts for a new trail so they can get away from the criminals. Steve tells the ladies what a great guy Clay is. Through the night, Clay leads the group along a new trail over the pass. They are stopped by Fowler, Sean McClory, who has a camp along the trail. Fowler invites the group to share his camp. Helen goes down to the creek to wash while Mary begins making a fire. Mary gets in Clay's bubble and they kiss until interrupted by Steve. Clay tells Steve that he doesn't want Mary around even though he kissed her. At the creek, Helen finds Fowler's gold panning equipment. He shows her the gold he has found and Helen decides to stay with Fowler. Clay and Mary pick up the kissing, and Mary wants sweet words. He won't say he loves her, and she storms off. Tell me, darling. What? What does a man usually tell a girl? Tell me, please. All right. You don't love me, so let it go at that. On the way, she finds out that Helen is staying. Helen and Mary fight about the future. Then Clay is mean to Mary. Mary steals his wagon and drives away. Clay and Steve chase after her. Before they can arrive, the horses break free and the wagon crashes into the stream. Clay rescues Mary from the creek. When she wakes, she is mad because her clothes are floating away. Clay is mad about the wagon being destroyed. Clay says he will be dropping her off at the first passing stage on the next road. Downstream, the convicts are crossing the stream and find some of Mary's clothes floating. By nightfall, the criminals have found the wrecked wagon. Later, they find Fowler's camp. Lednoff interrogates Fowler while the third guy finds Helen. They force Clay's location out of Helen, then murder Fowler. The fate of Helen is left open. Lednoff sees Clay's group in the distance. Steve puts the horses in a corral. Clay jumps on Steve for starting a fire. Steve stands up to Clay. Steve wants him to apologize to Mary. You ain't even man enough to own up when you're wrong. Go on, hit me. You sit down and eat. Till I say the word, you do what you're told. You ought to say you're sorry. That's what you ought to do. You keep your nose out of my life, young fella. Maybe I haven't lived as long as you have, but I know a sight more about people. And I wouldn't talk to a mule the way you talk to her. And if I did, I'd say how sorry I was. I'd be man enough to do that. The stage comes down the road and they prepare to put Mary on it. Clay tries to apologize, but he can't really do it. Mary leaves on the stage. Clay sends a message to the sheriff via the stage. Clay and Steve are about to break up their family slash partnership. Steve sees the three criminals coming down the trail. Clay and Steve go into the rocks to hide. Letnoff sends one man down to check on the camp. He sends the other off to his right. Clay shoots and kills the first criminal. He moves downstream as Lednoff takes a lower position by the stream. Steve covers from above. Clay fires from the stream and kills the second criminal. <coughs> Lednoff calls for Clay to come out. He then begins firing on the horses in the corral. Steve runs down to turn the horses out of the corral. He is wounded by Lednoff, but lets the horses go. Clay gets above Lednoff and shoots him. <coughs> the posse comes into town with the three dead bodies. A doctor is taking a bullet out of Steve. Hold her steady. I'm not hurting you. Maybe you're not, but I'll sure be glad when you stop poking me. Mary comes into the doctor's office. Mary begins to leave, saying that she's going to the other side of the street. Clay goes after her, and they kiss. Steve watches from inside. Clay proposes, and they all live happily ever after. Mary. That job you were talking about. Did you get it? Why? You said a man had to think enough of you to walk in the place you were working and take you out of there. Tomorrow I figured on doing just that. I haven't got the job yet. If you want to wait until tomorrow. Summary. 
On the western frontier, it was common for men to marry prostitutes. Girls vs. Globe website says, quote, Men of the Wild West often married working girls. Some famous examples include Wyatt Earp and both of his wives, Maggie and Josephine, unquote. Like most normal red-blooded males my age, I am somewhat obsessed with film noir bad girl Gloria Graham. When I saw that the movie Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool 2017 was about Graham and it starred the amazing actress Annette Bening, I was in for the ride. It was a real heartbreaker. The movie tells the story of Graham's later years in England, taking a younger lover and her battle with cancer. The movie is all based on actual events and it's a real tearjerker. In her life, Graham was panned with a story that she was having an affair with her 13-year-old stepson. Her fourth marriage was to her former stepson. For some reason, Graham thought she needed to improve her looks through plastic surgery. By 1955, multiple surgeries had paralyzed her upper lip. She would stuff tissue under her lip to make it look fuller. During kissing scenes, the leading man often ended up getting a mouthful of paper. Graham survived breast cancer in 1974, but it returned in 1980. Her children picked her up in Liverpool and forced her to return to the U.S. She died a painful death in 1981 at the young age of 57. World famous short summary, horses first, then love. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to follow the links in the show notes or from the site to visit our store and check out those original t-shirts. Beware the moors. <laughs>